I gave a presentation on other manifestations in hereditary transthyroid amyloidosis. And with other, we mean other manifestations than in neuropathy and cardiomyopathy. Since this is a systemic disease, it can affect almost whole, all of the body. But I'm going to focus on the ocular manifestations, the central nervous complications, digestive disturbances, and renal and adrenal dysfunction in this disease. When it comes to the ocular manifestations, you may know that there is a local production of TTR in the eye which can cause vitreous opacities, uh, changes of the corneal blood vessels, amyloid deposits in the lens, uh, retinal angiopathy, and there's also risk of glaucoma in these patients. An important note is that this is not prevented by the currently available therapies for the disease. Uh, and if you find them, you should treat them with topical treatments or surgery as per routine clinical practice, actually. If we move on to the CNS complications, uh, there's also a local production of transthyretin in the central nervous system. And uh, cerebrovascular events are quite common and also non-cerebral vascular events, such as epilepsy, migraine, and dementia. And there are some high-risk genotypes for this, uh, but it seems that this is a risk for all genotypes with time. And as for the ocular manifestations, these complications are not prevented by the currently available therapies. And we've shown that um, some of these, the cerebrovascular events are caused by atrial fibrillations in these patients, which can be prevented by anticoagulation therapy. But there are also signs of, uh, of um, cerebral and, uh, amyloid angiopathy, which can cause local uh, problems in the in the brain and in the meninges, uh, which of course is also a risk for cerebral hemorrhage. But it seems that it's safe to give them anticoagulation anyway. But probably you you should use the, the newer oral anticoagulants instead of warfarin. We can move on to the digestive disturbances, which are quite common also and can affect all of the GI tract from the mouth to the anus with different symptoms. And the pathophysiology behind this is uh, roughly motility disturbances in the GI tract, which in, in turn is caused by an autonomic neuropathy and probably also an enteric neuropathy and changes of the endocrine cells in the gut. We've also shown that uh, there's a depletion of the interstitial cells of Cajal in the gut, which uh, act as pacemaker cells and are important for the GI motility. And these motility disturbances in turn cause small bowel bacterial overgrowth and a malabsorption of both fat and bile acids, which uh, aggravate the symptoms. And you can actually get any GI symptom from these motility disturbances, but uh, early satiety, constipation, and alternating diarrhea and constipation are quite common symptoms, which often increase with time of the disease as well. And also, um, unintentional weight loss is quite common as a, an early symptom of the disease, even though you don't have any GI symptoms. And these symptoms are important since they, are, uh, they negatively affect the quality of life of the patient and can also affect survival negatively. Fortunately, the, these symptoms are treatable and it's important to, to investigate uh, what kind of problems the patients have if they have maybe delayed gastric emptying, bile acid malabsorption or even small bowel bacterial overgrowth. And you treat them accordingly with uh, either laxatives, antibiotics, or uh, stimulants of the gastric motility, such as metoclopramine. It's also important to check for signs of malnutrition, for example, B vitamins and iron, and uh, supplement accordingly. Uh, and since the patient also can uh, have malnutrition of vitamin D and calcium, it, they are at risk for osteoporosis, so, so you should perform bone density measurements and treat them with vitamin D, calcium, and maybe also bisphosphonates. Finally, we will have a look on the renal and adrenaline dif dysfunction in these patients. These disturbances are probably due to local 
the process of amyloid in the in the uh, kidney and the adrenal glands. Maybe there's also an autonomic dysfunction that uh, um, aggravates these problems. And when it comes to the kidney, proteinuria is another sign of a kidney infection, whereas renal failure is a later sign. And some patients even get end-stage renal disease and require renal transportation. And adrenal insufficiency is often overlooked, but it's easy to check with uh, a blood test to check the levels of morning cortisol. You treat these dysfunctions according to the routine clinical practice at your hospital. But they're important to remember and to evaluate also. So in conclusion, uh, hereditary transthyretin nebulosis is a truly systemic disease, which is more evident in long-standing disease. And very important to remember is that the central nervous system complications and the eye complications are not prevented by the currently available systemic therapies. But you can prevent cerebrovascular events with uh, anticoagulation therapy if the patient has atrial fibrillation or atrial flutter. And further, the digestive disturbances are common but mostly manageable in the disease. And you should not forget to evaluate the renal and adrenal function in these patients.